knowledge that the land on which we gather is of the Haldeman tract within the territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people. We also acknowledge that we are all treaty peoples, including those who came here as settlers, as immigrants either in this generation or in generations past, and those who came here involuntarily, particularly as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. We must also recognize the fact that this colonial nation is founded in historic and ongoing disposition, dispossession of this land's indigenous peoples and African descendant peoples. We especially pay tribute to the ancestors of those of African and indigenous origin and descent. We feel it is critical to be informed on the past and the ongoing consequences of colonialism. We encourage everyone to learn about the history of these lands and to support resistance here and across Turtle Island. Okay. Good day, everyone. How are you all doing today? Yeah, great. Thank you for being here. And as we say in the Caribbean, in Creole, Saka Fet, what's going on? <laughs> All right. I heard it, Moela. <laughs> Hi, I'm Darren James. I'm one of your MCs, and I'm a board member of CCAWR. And I bring Trinidadian and Tobagonian greetings. What's the scene, people? What's going on? My name is Anandi, and I'm your co-MC for today, and I'm also a board member of the CCAWR. So Anandi and I will be your hosts. Welcome to our Black History Month launch 2023. Thank you to the generous support of the Ken Sealin Waterloo Region Museum, the Region of Waterloo, the Waterloo Region Association of Realtors, who made this event possible. We extend special thanks to our elected officials who are present, Chair Karen Redman. Mr. Morris has just arrived. <laughs> OK. And we have, OK, yes. Um, <laughs> hello. So. I, I think, well, Mayor, thank you, Mayor, Mayor Barry, City, City of Kitchener, Mayor Barry Verbanovic. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Barry, for raising right. your hand. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. And as well, Mike Morris, um, Kitchener right. Center, oh. Liberal MP as well. Yes. yes, thank you. It's hard to see so many people. <laughs> thank you. Okay, currently, we'd like everyone to please stand if you are able for O Canada, played by our panelist, Suzette Vidal. We would like to welcome Amy Smoke and Anne Maria Beals from Land Back Camp. Ose Kenhion Hatate, otherwise known as Land Back Camp, as it is an indigiqueer to spirit, trans and non-binary space for urban indigenous youth and settler 
LGBTQ plus allies. They work closely with black and racialized communities as our liberation is bound together. Uh, Anne-Marie and uh, Amy Smoke, Amy and Anne-Marie, if you can join us, please. Indigenous people acknowledge the land in very different ways than a territorial acknowledgement or a land acknowledgement. Um, we take a moment as Haudenosaunee people to say the Ohanda of Gretawanekwa, the Thanksgiving address. These are loosely translated, the words that come before all else, the preliminary matters. These are the things we say every day to honor or acknowledge or agree. Everything in creation that allows us to even open our eyes, right? All those things we forget to honor and acknowledge and greet. The sun, the moon, the stars, all of those things. So you could hear a Thanksgiving address for two days, two hours. Mohawk people can tell a long story. Um, I will do one for two seconds here. Um, and what I'm saying is we'd like to honor, acknowledge, and greet all of the things in creation. We're gathering our minds together as one in a good way. Um, and if I don't say something, I leave it to you to honor, acknowledge, or greet in your own way. Mother Earth, I tell you, do have what you go to. A great onska and the walkway noon in what you go to. That new did you know that a day? Um, Ojita or Guma, the birds. I tell you, do have them what you go to. A great onska and the walkway noon in what you go to. That new did you know that a name, Gunning Gorunia, the water. I tell you, do have them what you go to. A great onska and the walkway noon in what you go to. That new did you know what I'm going to be some way. Yo, and now our minds are gathered together as well. So we'd like to offer uh, two songs, two welcome songs. Um, the Mohawk French song we will start with. We are on the land with the Mohawk one show many people today. Um, and it's called the Mohawk Friendship song because we are offering friendship to all who are on our lands today.
Coming up, Legacy. We're going to have a treat performance from Legacy. What is, sorry, let me get this in the correct order. What was, what is, what will be. On February 25th, 2003, coming up this month, Legacy performers will hit the stage to unapologetically express black joy, culture, beauty, and excellence. So we're happy to have with us today two featured Legacy performers, and we will start with Keo, Kiana Wilson on, she will treat us with a song, and she is also going to accompany herself on the keys. Welcome, Kiana.
to move into the next part. Darren, what's coming up next? What's coming up next is in theater room, which is directly over here, we have Blacks in Waterloo region, basically vintage images done by Aaron Francis. Thank you so much for your time. I uh, really look forward to just sharing this project with you. It's been a passion project of mine uh, that has quickly uh, really risen to the forefront of what takes up all my time, space, and energy, but it is such a rewarding endeavor. This, I should say, the, this image was taken by my grandfather, Roy Francis. Rest in peace. And this is my immediate family, my Uncle Dave, my mom, my grandmother, my Uncle Errol, and my Uncle Mark. So for those who aren't aware, I have been uh, fortunate enough with Vintage Black Canada to essentially tap into certain media, certain platforms, and express uh, my thoughts and opinions, not only on uh, being a black Canadian, but being a black Canadian from Kitchener-Waterloo. And I've been able to do so using uh, imagery that my grandfather took. So my grandfather, when he passed, he left behind so much documentation of the black experience, the black Canadian experience, as the West Indian immigrant experience in Kitchener-Waterloo. And with my stewardship of this archive, I was able to start Vintage Black Canada. And the origin story in and of itself isn't really that complex. Frankly, um, while growing up, I knew my grandfather was a photographer and I observed him and participated in his photography projects and he would develop the, a lot of his film in his own home. It was after he passed longing and yearning for remembering of him that I sort of stumbled on a bunch of his images and in doing so sought to, sought to commemorate him and also the region. So this image is currently at the University of Waterloo Art Gallery on the exterior. These are images that my grandfather took. And this is Black Waterloo, 1960s. And my grandfather was really good with the camera. I'm not sure if, if anyone's had a chance to get, a, to get out and see this physically. It's still there if you get a chance. Please do check it out. Uh, it's a series of images that we named Tamarack Drive. And I named it Tamarack Drive because that is where the family was living at the time in Waterloo. And quickly, the far left is Tamarack Drive, Waterloo, Ontario. Uh, the far right, that is uh, CNE, uh, actually Caravana. And in between these various images, you see the one uh, in the middle, that's my Uncle Errol looking through a viewfinder at Niagara Falls. So there's a series of images, but it was titled Tamarack Drive. So diving into the archive a little bit. So when I say that I stumbled onto images, I truly did. Like I said, my grandfather was always taking photos, always participating in various forms of media capture, 
videography, what have you. But when I started stumbling on some of these photos, particularly the top left one and the bottom, the bottom left one, I was just mind blown. Uh, the tone, the color, the, the, ad, ad, the attempt to, to demonstrate proportion and symmetry, it was, they were really good photos. And I do have an art background, it's a, a layperson's background in art, but I, I nonetheless could appreciate what I was looking at. Uh, the other image, just to show the contrast of some of the conditions of the stuff that I found, whereas some of them, uh, the ones on the left, uh, they're, they're all from the, the, the late 60s, and all, all these photos from the late 60s, but some of them were actually damaged. And, but nevertheless, I think it still adds to the character of them. Uh, I don't know who that family is as, alongside my family, but I feel like they're newcomers as well, or they were newcomers at the time. Really, I should shout out, and I have to shout out, uh, Leeds, England. So my family went from uh, Kingston, Jamaica. When I say my family, my grandfather went from Kingston, Jamaica. My grandmother followed. They went to Leeds, England. And in Leeds, England, uh, where a good deal of the family still lives, uh, from Leeds, England is where my family ended up then uh, immigrating to, to Ontario. So this is a photo of Leeds, England. Um, there's, there's a good number of family members in here that I could identify, but in the, in the middle, in the center, I wanted to just highlight uh, my great-grandfather, Raymond, and my great-grandmother, Jane, uh, the patriarchs and matriarchs of the family. And already at that point, they were a bit older when uh, the family started migrating out of Jamaica, and I think it's reflected there. Uh, I was really fortunate to get to spend time with them uh, as a young person. Just some other images when I'm talking about the archive, because not only did my grandfather take photos and spend a good deal of time trying to perfect his craft, he also collected imagery as well. Uh, this image on the left, that's, that's from the family archive. On the right, my grandfather, my grandfather Roy is actually in this photo, so he didn't take that photo. What he did is he also collected photos, or he made sure that the family was always getting their photos taken. And it's kind of a fascinating story that when I was going through the archive and combing through the archive, and I had to start discerning for myself which photos did my grandfather actually take and which ones did he not. If you have been to my page, Vintage Black Canada, on Instagram, you might see that I try the, my very hardest to credit the images. I never post an image that I don't have the, um, the permission to do so. Uh, for the most part, they're, they're images that my family owns. Uh, but my grandfather also collected images from this fellow named Gerald Don. And Gerald Don was a Jewish photographer in 1950s Leeds. And he was the go-to photographer for uh, black immigrants in, in, in England at the time, in Leeds specifically. And I know this because I looked Gerald Don up. All the, all the photos that I love that were my grandfather's were taken by Gerald Don. And so, you know what? And he stamped them on the back, and they're all beautiful, beautiful images. And so I started looking into this Gerald Don fellow, and turns out that someone was holding exhibits with Gerald Don's photos in, in Leeds, England, the, uh, the, the, the Jamaican Black Historical Society in Leeds, England. And so Gerald Don, just, I mean, briefly, the history is that following World War II, uh, England was economically destitute, and so they opened up themselves to the colonies, quote unquote. And so with these folks coming in, um, they were taking family photos and this sort of thing, and Gerald Don, the Jewish man, was the one taking a bunch of these photos. So the photo on the right is a Gerald Don photo. I have a lot of Gerald Don photos. This one is one of my grandfathers, though, and eventually, my grandfather himself was able to uh, master the craft of photography, in my humble opinion. That's a photo of my mom. And that's Canada. This is another photo, just, uh, just to give you a sort of a range of the, the archive. And I don't know where this is. I love this photo for a number of reasons. The colors just pop. Uh, a good deal of my grandfather's photos were taken on uh, Kodachrome. Uh, the type of film that National Geographic was using. And so as I was collecting them and finding them and developing them, the thing that stood out to me right off the bat were some of the colors and the way they pop. You see my great-grandmother Jane in her, her pink dress, or my grandmother Muriel, that, that yellow uh, top, it just looks beautiful. Oh, sorry, guys. Uh, another one of Roy's photos. I really, really came to understand that Roy took photography seriously 
when I started studying some of these photos, I can almost guarantee that he told the two subjects that are looking off camera to look off camera, you know, and telling the other people look directly ahead, that sort of thing, staging the photos, uh, but at the same time having fun with them. N this is, again, so this is uh, 1960s Waterloo. So I love it because, you know, when folks think of Kitchener Waterloo, they do not uh, picture, uh, they don't picture black people. I know this, because even black people don't picture black people in Kitchener Waterloo. When you go to Toronto, there's like, oh, there's black people in Waterloo? So I love that I have a photographic record of our existence, uh, not, just for, uh, not just for others, but for ourselves. And it's a great reminder. And I also love that my grandfather took great pains to capture some of these, these really important ritualistic moments, such as birthdays, weddings, uh, and, and just, you know, social gatherings. Uh, a big part of the vintage black Canada aesthetic is frankly candid moments, moments of joy. Uh, it has been said that acts of joy uh, are, are, are in and of themselves uh, a form of black rebellion, which is key and necessary. So a little bit on the genealogy, and I've been diving into this. I am a student at the University of Waterloo, uh, but I'm a student of political science. Nevertheless, I, history comes into play, and I found the genealogy and the histor history of my own family fascinating. I'll briefly dive into that. Some of the other things that I found in my archive, because among other than the photos that my grandfather graciously left for us, he also left his record collections, his cassettes, his VHS tapes, and also he left, like I have like the birth, the wedding, the marriage certificates uh, for for his, him and his my grandmother, and I even keep going. Like I have my great grandmother's passports, and so starting with this stuff, I was able to just do a bit more research. Uh, for example, you're looking here at. My great-grandmother's passport, Westmoreland, Jamaica. And my great-grandmother uh, was what they would say is a, was a, was a light-skinned woman. And, and it has to do with her, her, um, her Scottish lineage, and which is super fascinating to me. I love the fact that I also have Scottish blood. And uh, I've taken some, some interest in understanding the rest of that. Um, but I also took a great interest in, my, in her husband, my great-grandfather's lineage. And he's from Porter's Mountain, Jamaica. And he's, I was always made to understand as a young person that uh, he was of a particular type of lineage, uh, essentially directly African lineage. So let me go into that a little bit. Oh, this is another image of my great-grandfather. This is another one, for example, that my grandfather Roy had in his collection, 1920s. Look at that. Beautiful. The ancestors of the Maroons of Jamaica were enslaved Africans who had been brought there by the Spanish in the 16th and 17th centuries and later by the British who captured Jamaica from Spain in 1655. So I was, uh, I was made to understand that my grandfather was a descendant of the Maroons. And helping my, help knowing that, but not really having the, 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 the wherewithal of what that meant, uh, drove me to understand further. So... If it's helpful to the far left, Westmoreland, where my great-grandmother's from, uh, you see St. James and Maroon Town, sort of in between Westmoreland, St. James, St. Elizabeth is where you find Porter's Mountain, where Raymond Roddick is from. And just greater context, pull it out. Jamaica's in the middle, uh, to the left of Haiti, under, under south of Cuba. So the West Africans who hailed mainly from the Akan tribe, they were brought to Jamaica to work the sugarcane fields by the British, who imported over 700,000 Africans between 1655 and 1807. So I want to just put this into to further context. My great-grandfather, Raymond, was descendant of Maroons, and the Maroons were descendant of the Akan tribe from West Africa. And the reason my great-grandfather looks as dark he is is because the Maroons are the Africans that fought back in Jamaica and one for themselves, sovereignty within the island of Jamaica. So just again, further context, slave trade. 4.5 million brought to the West Indies. After a series of wars with the colonial government in Jamaica, one group of Maroons was deported to Nova Scotia in 1796 while Maroon communities existed in Nova Scotia for only four years before they were sent to Sierra Leone. Their legacy in Canada endures. So all of this uh, really started to fascinate me, tying things in. So here you have 
essentially, you have the Akan tribe in West Africa. Certainly, there were warriors. When I started reading further into it, they were like essentially like African special forces, like from a medieval kingdom. Um, they nevertheless uh, were enslaved either by the British or their neighbors, their enemies, because that was a punishment at the time. If you defeat your enemy, you'd sell them into slavery, you'd sell them into slavery to the British. They brought these people to, to Jamaica, and then as soon as they got there, uh, they freed themselves in shackles and went to war with, with England. And the anglo akan War is a thing that is not really taught. Uh, I've had to educate myself. But needless to say, they beat England twice. Uh, and this is fascinating. And so, you know, you might want to dive further into that on your own. But recall what the previous slide was saying. Some of them that were captured and or sold uh, in Jamaica themselves were then shipped to Nova Scotia. And so some of the original, we talk about uh, black settlements in Nova Scotia, these are, the first ones are Ghanians brought to Jamaica, then brought to Nova Scotia. And then from there to Sierra Leone. It's crazy. Oh, so probably a bit out of context here. Remember I mentioned the photo gallery in Leeds. That's my Uncle Frankie to the left. That's a Gerald Don photo, by the way. Look at the contrast on that. Hip hop was my everything. So perhaps I should digress at this point. I, I wanted to talk about the archive. I wanted to talk about the genealogy. <clears throat> and I think maybe it's always important for me to shout out hip hop because everything that I've done with this archive and even just my approach to research and presentation and aesthetics, it all comes from hip hop. And I like to take a moment and just shout out hip hop culture because there was a time uh, growing up when it was one of the few things that made me feel like uh, a welcome human. Uh, hip hop culture, uh, these are just brief examples on the far left. That's my brother, it's a poster that uh, we designed for one of his projects. Everything is handcrafted from the, the logo was hand drawn, the photography spot on. Even like we took great pains even to address his hairstyle, you know, saying that's a, that's a braided mohawk. And then on the far right, for us being, this is a, a rap crew I was in like decades ago, literally. Um, and like to be on the cover of a, a print publication, it meant everything to us. Um, there's, probably, there's probably only like one thing I ever failed at in life, which is like becoming like a rap superstar. But that failure allowed me to, to achieve basically everything else that <laughs> I've done thus far. So <laughs> digressing once again, let me shout out some of the architects that have lent to what it is that I do. When I say architects, uh, I mean the photographic, the black photographic giants. Uh, James Van Der Zee. James Van Der Zee is someone that was photographing what they call the Harlem Renaissance. And James Van Der Zee, basically, he was photographing his community. You know, not unlike my grandfather. Um, not all of my grandfather's images are this glamorous, but not all of uh, James Van Der Zee's are either. Uh, nevertheless, huge influence on what you could largely refer to as black portraiture. Gordon Parks, if you ever have an opportunity or if you're ever wanting to know more about the, again, the black portraiture space, you cannot ignore Gordon Parks. It's beautiful. Jamal Shabazz, probably my favorite, because Jamal was this person that basically New York City, where the birthplace of hip hop was occurring, can't get enough of, of um, I, can't, I can't revere hip hop enough. Because essentially these are, these are poets, right? They're lyricists that, that essentially say, my art is better than your art. And they say it so loudly and so proudly that it manifests itself right in front of your face. This is how good my art is. My, I can dance better than you. Oh, I can dance better than you. And then they'll literally be break dancing, dancing, dancing off one another. Anyhow, Jamel Shabazz captured that, that emergence, that manifestation, and, and he did so Really, the same way that, that I think a way that really I love f photography that that is that is for the people and of the people. I hope that makes sense. 
some of my contemporaries, folks that are also trying to archive the communities. Uh, June Lee. June Lee is a person that he sort of rose to fame by uh, exhibiting and archiving, cataloging images, Polaroid images of black families. So certainly not unlike what I'm doing. Um, however, in the Canadian space, I, I, I somewhat stand apart. But it's nothing new in terms of what's been taking place all these years, especially in the United States. So June Lee, June Lee is some person, wanted, someone that did that. Uh, some other of my contemporaries, just briefly, uh, far left, someone that's archiving stuff in New Jersey. Uh, in the middle, uh, really, their whole aesthetic is uh, candid images of, of black women. And then uh, Lifestyle 100, uh, again, New York City, uh, the hip hop era. Uh, you know, I can't get enough of it. And I just love that we all, it's a really small community, the community of archivists and amateur archivists, really. Um, I don't know what de defines professional and, and amateur in other minds, um, but, you know, we didn't have any formal training in this. We just had access to photos and a love for the culture. Uh, black Home Virginia, again, you know, candid portraitures, uh, black people having fun. We don't necessarily always have to be uh, entertaining someone or performing for someone. And a few others. In the end. Thank you very much. some stuff that was missing in there that we would like for you guys to touch on, just for a few, uh, about a minute and a half at the most. And while you're doing that, I also would like for you to touch on um, the first subject, which is going to be, I know it takes a lot to run for office, for public office. It takes a lot on the campaign. And it affects not just the three guys that are sitting here, but your families as well. And I just want to hear from you how you either br brought that to your family or how they took it the first time you told them that, hey, I'm thinking about running for office. I will start with Maiden because you're the closest to me. So <laughs> she's looking at me like, boy, don't start. <laughs> However, as the elder, <laughs> so to address the last part of the question first, um, I'm an empty nester, and so, um, you know, I have one son living on the West Coast and one son living on the East Coast, and so their encouragement came, uh, you know, electronically and, and so on. But in terms of running for office, everything I have done in terms of equity and advocacy has been because I have felt the need to speak up and counter a narrative that, for whatever reason, I thought uh, did harm to others. And that is the reason I ran for office. I, it was no big decision, it was no um, you know, big ambition. It was a reaction to the narrative that's become dominant in our community and which I wish more people would speak up against. But I thought I will have one last tour and my last tour will be an attempt to counter the narrative and hopefully bring us back to some possibility to some area where we can have civil discourse, agree to disagree, and respect each other's opinions. What is the other thing I have to talk about? <laughs> Just anything else that was missing on your introduction that you know? Um, 
Well, I guess I, in terms of myself, you have heard about, uh, you know, my career and all of that. But yes, I came here, um, I guess, 37 years ago and with two young children. And so I saw community involvement as a way not only to um, make friends and to fit into the community, but also a way of understanding how it was I needed to support my two boys. And so I have been involved in community continuously in a variety of organizations. And um, I have found that being a part of your community helps you to see what needs to be done, helps you when you decide to stand up and speak up. It gives you networks and friends and supports in unexpected places. So I have been very fortunate in terms of um, many things in Waterloo Region, and I am thankful for the many people who have stepped up and supported me, not just in, you know, in this election campaign, but in other areas of equity, because I have been, um, as I mentioned, involved in several things. I have been, I volunteered with the YWCA, with the Child Witness Center, when my boys were young, with soccer and all of those kinds of things, and I think the variety and, um, of experience and contact has definitely helped me in my decision to uh, work as trustee. Hi, Hi everyone. I uh, hope you're having a great day. Uh, my name is Ayo Owuduni. Um, originally from Lagos, Nigeria. I moved to Canada six years ago. Uh, before I even dive deeper into me, I want to give a big shout out to my wife and partner who is not here because she is watching the kids and we take turns doing this with one another depending on uh, she does this for me and then she travels to Nigeria regularly so I have to watch the kids for three four weeks when she's gone so uh, I accumulate <laughs> and then it balances out when she does her travels, and I think it's important to also share that because many don't have the opportunity for me to do this. Uh, for, I mean, many don't have the opportunity to do this because they don't have someone to support them in terms of watching the kids or doing things like that. So I think it's important to also share that. When I decided to run, one activity that we do as a family, we usually write a five-year plan together. And I would say probably about four or five years ago, this was something that was part of the plan, to run for public office. So she had already known, and she was quite aware of this, and we've had many conversations. And I mean, one, the final hurdle I needed to cross over was a question that she had asked, I don't want you to be a politician, you know, be real. And if you feel this is not for you, just step out. And that was a commitment that I made to, to her. Most of the things on my website and materials was all written by my wife, so she's the smarter of the two. So I always uh, make sure I, I, I put that out there. I'm also the last born of six. Uh, so if for all the last borns and the young ones out there, I was never really taken seriously. You know, in my family, I was always the one that was made fun of because I was always the one with the crazy dreams and things that I wanted to do. But I thought it was pretty cool that, you know, inauguration and things of the like, my family were able to come and celebrate. And my sister walked around and said, that's my brother, that's my brother, that's my brother. But during the election, she was like, what are you doing? <laughs> so sometimes the importance of that, preserving your self-belief and knowing that, uh, knowing your plan and this is what I want to do is so important and so crucial. I don't come from a big wealthy or that type of family. I come from a very humble family. I always say that probably the smartest thing that I did was I married into a wealthy family. <laughs> uh, but I didn't even know that was even uh, something. But we moved here six years ago and I just saw an opportunity to serve. I served with the Nigerian Association. I did some work with the African Associations. I joined several boards, and I saw this as an opportunity to serve on a larger scale. And from four or five years ago, I just thought this was something that I wanted to do. And I just built a plan over time uh, to make it happen. And here we are five years later, 
And yes, we are also putting together five-year plans for the next five years. So whenever we're in a conversation, I probably will ask you, what's your five-year plan? It's something I'm passionate about. I talk about all the time. Thank you. Thanks, Colleen. Hi, so thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so I'm the last of four children, so I know what it's like to always have to fight for your spot and to be recognized and all of the things. But, um, you know, uh, one of the things that's missing from the bio that is new is that I'm a regional counselor at the region of Waterloo, but I'm also chair of planning and works, which is a huge, huge umbrella in terms of how we plan, develop, grow the services, your transportation, roads, planning all of that out. Um, so so just, just one other thing to add there, and also Grand River Conservation Authority. So things like our water and, and preservation and, and all of the things. So just something else to add in there, along with some boards and committees I won't get into. But uh, in terms of planning to run, um, you heard from my bio, I spent about 15 years working for municipal governments, understanding systems, understanding how things operate, uh, I initially, years ago, wanted to get into law, and I had an opportunity when I was in university, and I worked for Premier Mike Harris, dating myself a bit, but understanding, you know, government at that level, and then coming and working at the, the regional level and the municipal level and understanding how important it is, how the decisions being made impact our daily lives, and seeing in my time working there that we have to do things differently. The models that have been used for decades don't work anymore. So um, my spark to run, I've been asked multiple times to run, and many people who uh, have run for office, people will say they've been asked about seven times. That was the case, and I really had to think long and hard about where I can make the most impact, but coming back to what others have said, that need to be grounded in community and to make sure that what is being decided on, that it's directly reflecting what the community needs are. So I, I put my name in for, for this election, 2022. It came with a lot of conversations with my family. Some of my family members were like, finally, to be honest, and even some friends from way back when said finally, but you know, I had to have a serious conversation because running for office is not easy. You're, you're out daily as a, a woman, a black woman, I'm a mother of a uh, five-year-old, knowing that be, I, I'd be away from the house. And, and there, is, there are thoughts and feelings that come with that, especially with children that are, that are a young age. And having a conversation with my husband, Darren, who, who's you know, helped out with today, and you probably heard him on the mic a few times, recognizing that um, you know, there's some trade-offs that are gonna have to happen, but you know, I couldn't do it without his support my parents, um, siblings, and even friends. So it was a, a, lots of deep conversations, but knowing that the outcome is to make, make change. So uh, I guess I'll stop there, but um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a process. <laughs> uh, I'm just gonna add that uh, what's, with, what's with these youngest kids in the family always whining, crying, <laughs> Uh -huh. that's, that's your uh -huh. job. It comes in the job description. You're supposed to be beaten down on it. <laughs> we're always the baby. If my mom were here, she'd be like, you're the baby. <laughs> you know, you're the baby, so you know, that's your job. <laughs> uh, hand it over to Marcy so you can do the next question. Well, first of all, thank you for that wonderful round of applause and support. Um, totally unprepared, and I will get him later. <laughs> um, it is an absolute delight for me to see this. I've been here for 40 years. I've been looking forward to this. <laughs> you know, people have said to me, well, why didn't you run for office? You know, you've been here 40 years. You used to show up at everything, and I did. But... I didn't feel that that was my role. My role was to be from behind and keep pushing people to do it, especially when I saw that they had the skills, they had the, the, the tenacity, and they had the support. So I was supposed to be part of the support. So that's why I'm absolutely, yes, I will. Thank you. I, I felt it was absolutely necessary for me to be behind the scenes and keep pushing, all right? So it's really important that 
no matter what you're doing here today, remember, you too could be a pusher, okay? Mm -hmm. You too can do it. So don't forget that you can't do it. You still can't hear? Yeah. It should be on. Yeah. Just pull down. Yeah. Somebody else is not hearing well, I guess. I'm sorry, I can't speak any louder and I'm not sure how you turn it up. Okay? Yeah. So maybe we can ask somebody can to do use that. Your mic? No, I'll just turn it up. Can, can you turn it up? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Is that better now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay, great. Thank you very much for indicating that. That's terrific. Now, Tapua and I came prepared today with a few questions. <laughs> and really what we want everybody to know is that this is a celebration. It's a celebration. We are so sorry that Hans is not here um, because he too is part of this wonderful group, okay? Um, so we want to remember Hans in this uh, uh, conversation. Um, one of the things that didn't happen when I was younger is this thing called social media. And I have to tell you, I'm not overly happy with it. <laughs> but then again, it might be my age, okay? Mm -hmm. so. I would like to ask our panelists, social media, its impact so far on you in your new role. And I know you only took on the role in October, but you know, a lot can happen between October and January, and yeah. February yes. the 5th. So whoever wants to start, talk about the impact of social media on you so far, um, and then maybe there, I can come with a supplemental question well, after that. Start. So I'll start with this because I remember I was working um, in government when social media kind of really kicked off and Twitter in particular. And I remember having a conversation with the communications director and um, we were saying this is going to be our new press release. Just watch. Uh, some of those who work at the region, you may remember Brian Stortz, that this is going to be our, 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 um, our press release. And so Social media has been challenging to navigate because it is, um, people can hide behind themselves. There is a lot of hatred. Uh, we are all black individuals sitting here and we know that social media is a lot of, a lot of the hate that comes out is, is coming through social media. So we have to navigate that. And I remember with the campaign and thinking about, should I you know, use social media? Um, should I avoid it? And the realities are we can't avoid it. And I looked at um, you know, former President Obama and his campaign was based off of a social media campaign. So I said, okay, we're gonna have to use social media, but this is where we can control the narrative in particular of our campaign. And, and um, I've, had, I've spoken with a lot of people in media about this and there's, there's, there's pros and cons, but the reality is as an elected official, um, using that tool to connect and communicate with community. And this is how I see it. So there are decisions that are being made. There are people who are following, and you should be following all of us on social media, that's a plug, because this is how we push out information. This is a way to connect with us. Um, and I think we have, to, we have to embrace it, but know and recognize when it is, it is being used in a negative way. And I will tell you, there are comments, there are decisions that are being made that may be negative, and I try not to read social media, but there's always that one comment that's like, thank you for doing what you're doing. That is, that is what I, I, I pay attention to, but you know, Instagram, Facebook, it's creating an extra layer of work, obviously, but if you're committed in engagement, you know that you're gonna have to use this tool and it can't be avoided. And literally, this is the way we've had amplified issues related to Black Lives Matter, right? It, it, is, it is a form, a tool used to engage and there's negative and there's positive, but I think if we're doing this correctly, it is a way for us to ensure we're, we're understanding what's happening in the community. Okay, I can go. <laughs> So I use social media to, to educate, I use it to inform, I use it to inspire, and here's what I mean. Uh, educate, when I went door to door, I realized not many people know much about municipal politics. I would hear comments like, another election? Or which party are you representing? Uh, or people would share what is a regional issue when I'm running for city, or people would say, well, Colleen came knocking on the door a few days ago, and I'm like, well, that's for regional, I'm city, oh, and they're confused. So I'm realizing more and more there are a lot of people in our communities that just don't know much about how things work. 
The only time they speak up is when they react because they're seeing something and they react out of anger, frustration, and they don't have much knowledge of things. So I'm starting to use it to educate. Um, I believe on Thursday or Friday, my team, we're gonna be pushing information out. We're calling it Local Government 101. And once a week, we're gonna be just providing information on what the city does and how we do the things we do and how a budget system, uh, process works and just that type of information. We wanna keep it simple and straightforward for people so people can catch it. That's number one. Number two, I use it to let people know where I am and what I'm doing. So that way people who are in the community can see that, okay, he's doing his job or what he swore an oath to is actually out there doing those things, representing the community, meeting with the community, going to the different events, having conversations. So I think it's important that people are aware of that as well. But then I also use it to inspire. I'm from Nigeria. I moved here six years ago. And our brand, or the name Nigeria, is not always good in the public spotlight. You know, So when people think of Nigerians, there are comments that can come up. I've had conversations with people where people will make a joke about, oh, are you a scammer? Are you the Nigerian prince with a million dollars? I've heard that many times from different people. So my goal is to ensure that people see that there is a Nigerian who is representing a community that is not majority Nigerian and who's going to do the best that he can and is going to push to show excellence uh, in his role as well. I also use it to inspire Nigerians back home that, hey, we can do, <laughs> I have a Nigerian that is <laughs> throwing our hands up back there. But I do think it's important because I get messages on a regular basis from Nigerians who look like me, who don't have the opportunity to leave the country and are probably struggling, but an opportunity to see someone that looks like them, sounds like them, has their name, who's lived in their country, understands what they're going through and, and is able to go somewhere else and still make a name for himself. Uh, I believe that, import, that story is so crucial and is so important to tell. And sorry, I just want to share one last story. I remember in 2012, it was probably like 1 a.m. at night, and there are gunshots going off like crazy. Now, I didn't come from the good side of Lagos. I came from the other side of Lagos. There were a lot of just gunshots that night. I remember, you know, my mom was just walking through and was like, hey, just lay low in your room. Don't step out. You know, we don't know where they are. It was literally the next street over. And in the, in the morning when we all went out, you know, we saw a car, you saw the gunshots, you saw blood everywhere, you saw bullet holes in someone's, uh, one of my friend's homes, and everyone was just walking by like it was normal, because it was normal. I had just moved back to Nigeria at that point from the US, because I went to school in the US, and there were several situations like that that were traumatic for me, but was normal for everybody else. We were robbed once and my friend was negotiating with the robber and they had guns to our heads. I was screaming. I almost lost my mind. They were taking his phone and he was negotiating for a SIM card. He's like, you got the phone. Give me the SIM card. And then they told him to put his hands up and he puts the phone up with his second phone with his hand. And they slap him. And then he's like, can I have my second SIM card? Well, I'm lying on the floor going, oh God, oh God, I hope they don't shoot. But I say all that to say, think of the trauma that people are going through, then I quote unquote escape from that. And here I am somewhere else. I feel it's important that those individuals that are still living in that situation, that still have to go through that on a day-to-day -day basis, they see someone that looks like them and say, okay, if he can make it, I can also make it. I just need to work hard to get out of this as well. However, I don't check my comments on social media. So you can see me post a lot. You will never see me reply to comments because I have to protect my mental health. I don't want to know what people think or say. I will push the information out, but I'm not going to be reading it to get that type of information back. If you see any responses, it's probably from a member of my team. It's not me. I don't check it to protect my mental health. Thank you. That, that question is a loaded question. <clears throat> Social media is a two-edged sword, and I, Colleen and um, I have in detail uh, given you its benefits in terms of 
communicating information and um, increasing awareness. The other side is when it's used to distract and to misinform mm -hmm. and uh, the level of uh, municipal government that I'm in, the school board, is probably the best example of how it can be used to seriously um, damage the integrity and character of people who are working hard to do what's best for um, children. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, in the school board, I don't know how many of you who follow, but you know, there is, um, there is a great push for equity in all of its forms. And many of us struggle with equity. So we may, for example, support anti-racism but we are not able to support um, sexual orientation and identity, or it may be we are not able to support um, you know, interfaith issues and so on. But a school board has to put and has to support equity in all its forms because it's public education. And so the public comes through the doors in public schools, you don't say, who are you, what do you believe in? You cannot come here. Public schools reflect the public, and so it's the job of the school board to support, lift up, and validate every identity, every child that is in its classrooms. And this proves contentious because we have people who are not able to accept that certain forms of equity are okay. So right now, a lot of school board issues are being discussed and fought in social media, which as Ayo just uh, mentioned, is a very unhealthy place to do that. It impugns people's character, it's affects people's mental health, and there is no ability to defend yourself or to give your side of the story because no one is interested in your side of the story. The people who are attacking you are just looking for other reasons to attack you. So that if you reply, your reply is then used in some way against you. So I have... I'm not sure what I think about social media. It certainly was meant to and can be a tool for good and for positive, but the few months that I've been in public office, it's proved to be a, a tool for hate, for misinformation, for attacking people's character and integrity, and really for affecting people's mental health in a bad way. I just wanted to say something based on that. Yeah, um, you know, the one thing to recognize is when a tool becomes dehumanizing. And I do agree, platforms, especially Twitter, can be very dehumanizing and takes away the person um, and, and basically anything that that person may feel or think and, and dehumanizes. So being mindful of that, and I do agree that the mental health health is key. I don't think social media is going anywhere. So we have to learn and be conscious of navigating that because of you know the negative impacts, but also seeing seeing through some of the positive that that it does bring. Uh, so having said all that, actually, before I go into the next question, I want to make sure that we uh, we keep you guys uh, involved as well. We just don't want to stand here and. Throw information at you while you you know sit and absorb as much as you can, or tap the ones that you don't want to listen to. Uh, so if anybody has any questions, um, if you I don't know how I'm going to do this, you can either raise your hand and I will walk over to uh, to you with the mic and you can ask your question. So or you can make eye contact and you know wink wink. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, I'm wearing my glasses. I'm wearing my glasses, so I should be able to. Uh, I should be able to see you. Okay. So before I get to you, um, you guys were talking about social media and um, how much it can be stressful. Um, what then do you guys? Uh, if you just take a quick uh, thirty seconds or so, what is it that you do to um, distress mm -hmm. from all this? you know, stress that's being thrown at you all the time. And uh, now that you're in elected positions, it's even more worse because I know, um, I've known all of you guys for a while now and I'll come to you and I'll say, hey, now that you're in elected, in elected office, this is what I want, you know, and you should be able to do it. And those people that voted for you are saying the exact same thing, but you are operating within a system that limits exactly what you can do. So with all that stress and uh, everything that's been thrown at you, what is it that you do to, uh, to distress? <laughs> any, any, any one of you guys can take it. Ayo, you want to start? Well, I'll start. <laughs> so I am thankful for friends who uh, lift me up and encourage me. But I also continue to do what I have often done. I walk, I sing in a choir, I go to the gym, and I just recently started steel pan lessons. So maybe one day you will see me out front <laughs> with my steel pan. Okay, I am. I, I love to exercise. I have a morning routine I go through every morning where it involves meditation, it involves reading for 30 minutes, and it involves exercising for 30 minutes as well. Tr break, make sure you're breaking a sweat. Uh, and I make sure I do it before anybody in the house wakes up. So I'm mentally ready uh, to take care of kids and to be a husband, to be a father uh, through that process. And I have a routine in the evenings as well. Um, that I go through with uh, green tea, exercising, and make sure you're drinking water all through the day as well. So for, for me, those things are important. I love to write. I'm working on my second book, so I'm constantly thinking and doing a lot of writing. I think it's a way for me to just get things out of my head um, and, and, and somewhere. The, the goal is for us all to die empty, right? So uh, that's part of my plan uh, as well. So, but honestly, that, that really helps me with, with uh, distressing. You guys are good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's important. <laughs> so I try and go for walks when I can. Um, it, it's ebbs and flows. You know, there are some weeks where I can be, I can, I can unplug. And I'm just gonna keep it real because the regional level and, and what we're dealing with now is heavy, it's a lot. And there are days where I turn around and I have to think, did I eat? But I will say I do have a good support network and I have friends when I need to just, I'm coming over, not talking politics. They've known me since I was 10 years old and we just talk about everything else but, and I think that is, that is one, of, one of the ways that I have to just de-stress. Sometimes I will take long drives, so I don't live too far from some of the townships. So I go out and I just get in the car and drive and listen to music. I, I like music. Music is, is what relaxes me. So oftentimes, even before big meetings, anything like that, I will be in the office and I'll have music on just to kind of center and ground me. Uh, it is, it's not also just the stress of being at that table. What I'm noticing, I don't know if any of the others have, it's sometimes when you're just being out in public. You know, I went to the doctor's office over the holidays and the doctor started talking to me about politics and government and I thought, okay, I'm not here for this. Um, you know, so I, ver I recognize very clearly now that at any given time, you know, there's, there are things that we're deciding that it's impacting community and we can, it, it's not just at that table. It also is out in the public with us too, but for me, music, drives, I go to my, my friends and, and my, my network, and it is just completely, if it's watching, binge watching a show on Netflix for a few hours, and, and yeah, I'll go for walks. I should work out more, but I don't. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you, thank you guys. Uh, we, have, I have, we have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is gonna be coming from, your name, please? Blessing. Blessing, do you have a question for somebody specific or it's just going to the whole panel? It's going to everyone, so 
Thank you very much. It's not so much a question as much as an encouragement because I thought each of you, and like I said, I'm extremely inspired by what you do. So first of all, let me say thank you to Rome for Office for putting this together and having us learn and listen to this conversation. Um, I came in midway, but I got a bit about social media and its impact. I believe before we had town criers walking through the streets, you know, giving passing information, and you heard it in your rooms, or as close as you were to where the town crier was passing by, and social media is just that. The advantage is that it gives you the opportunity to engage with those people whose opinions that, you know, is being shared. It can be dehumanizing, it can be scary, but specifically, it takes a lot of courage. And so I really want to encourage you all to please keep being that voice, but at the same time, forgive yourselves when you make mistakes. Like, we're human, we recognize that. With the skill of navigating social media, it's a skill to identify what is known as haters. And so you know when comments are coming just from a place of, I want to pull this person down. And so you let it roll off your back. As black politicians, you are a role model for so many of us watching up, looking at you and following the footsteps that you have put in place. You cannot be bullied into silence. You cannot be shunted and kept quiet just because someone is going to say something in the comment section. And I read the comment section. I can definitely see your supporters are far more than the naysayers. So keep up with the good work. We love you and we absolutely are rooting for you. Thank you. Yes, thanks for coming to today's workshop. So we have a mix of people and it's totally cool. I'm all about you guys coming and experiencing the illustrious steel pan, all right? So here's my question to you. We know that this is called, this is a steel pan. What other name do we know that this is called? Anybody know? What else can this be called? And I'm just gonna say, kids, you wanna take off your jacket and get a little comfortable? You can put your jacket right on the counter and get, get comfortable, okay? Right on the counter and come right back. There you go. So another name for the steel pan is steel drum. Another name is pan. So any of those three names are fine. Now, quick, quick question. Just a little interactivity. Where are these instruments from? Does anyone know? Where's this instrument from? Yes. Go for it. Yes. It's okay. Go for it. It's okay, say it, say it. Say it. No, I want to know what you think. There are no wrong answers here. Look, look, I'm not looking. You tell me. Welcome, come inside, welcome. Where are these instruments from? Do you guys know? What country? What country are these instruments from? What country do you think it's from? Yes. What country? Do you want to guess? They're all just like, nope. Yes. Trinidad and Tobago. That's right. Trinidad and Tobago. And in Trinidad, it is very, very cold, right? No, it's not. It is very, very hot in the Caribbean. Now, these instruments, before they were actually instruments, they were oil drums. So these were large steel containers. Come inside. Come inside if you're coming. Yep, come. Come inside. It's okay. All right. These were large oil drums. Do we know, do we know our 3D shapes? Cylinders? So these were in cylindrical containers. Yes. But the difference is that this part was flat, right? This part of the container was flat. But when we look at our instruments in front of us, these are concave, right? So what's happened is that the instruments have been sunk. We've used hammers, not me in particular. And we've also used 
heat to stretch the metal. And what happens when we stretch the metal? We can accommodate more notes on the instrument, okay? So tell me real quickly, if you were to count from the note that's in front of you and go around your pan, only on the notes that are on the outside, how many notes do you see? Let's count. You tell me. How many notes? Yes. Count one more time. Did you get 12 this time? It's okay, count, go ahead, go for it. It's not a problem, we'll wait. Did you get 13 again? Let's start on this one. Okay, C. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve notes. So, in Western music, we have twelve notes. Well, I should say we have letters that represent sounds. We have twelve notes, but we have notes that to get those sounds, and we want to sign that sound a note. We sign it a letter. So in music, we have A, we have B. What else do we have? We have C, then we have D. After D is E, you can say it nice and loud. After E is F, after F is G, and after G is H, right? Is there H in music? No, and there's no W either. Nice try. So when we look at our steel pen, I like to say, think of a piano, right? When you sit at a piano, you're sitting in the middle, right? Same thing, when we stand in front of our steel pen, we stand right in front of it, in the middle. And the note we're, we're, that we're going to start with is the note C, which is right in front of you. Think of a clock, and at the six o'clock position, that's where our C is, okay? So you're gonna pick up your sticks, and we're gonna do something called rolling. I'm looking for my sticks. Jeff, have you seen, I feel like I'm missing a pair of sticks. No? Do you ha is there another, uh, an extra pair of sticks? I feel like I'm missing sticks. Oh, you have sticks, perfect. So I'm gonna demonstrate, just take that one for me. I'm gonna demonstrate what rolling looks like like this. Do you see how low my sticks are? My sticks are nice and low. I'm not playing like this. They're not coming out of the instrument. They're nice and low. And I'm using, what are these things called? What are these? What, are, what part of my body is this? My wrists. That's right. So we're using our wrists. There we go. So what I want everyone to do is I want everyone to find the letter C. I want you to find with your eyes the letter D. So C is first. And then you're going to look for the letter D. So that means you're skipping a note. And then you're going to, I know yours isn't labeled. So there's your C. Then there's our D. And then there is our E. OK? There's our C. There's our D. Yep, so you jump over to D. There you go. And then we're going to jump over to E. Right. And I love that you found D. The only thing is I'm going to take your sticks and I want you to play it like this. So take, there you go. Just like that. Can you stand right back in front of your instrument? And I want you to stretch to, there you go. Good stuff. So what we're going to do is we're going to play together, okay? Here we go. First note is C. Here we go. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, before we begin, I'm going to count to four and then you're going to join me, okay? I'm going to tap on the steel pan and then you're going to roll for four beats. Here we go. One, two, three, four. Roll on C. Two, three, four, and stop. All right, so you guys are already superstars. You already know what comes next. So let's try that. We're going to go from C, then we're going to go to D, and then we're going to go to E. But my friend, what is your name? Say it nice and loud. One more time. Unum. What I want you to do is I want you to try to plant your feet right in front of your pan. Because I know sometimes we want to move to where the notes are, but I want you to instead stretch your arms to those notes, okay? 
Good stuff. All right, let's try it again. I'm going to I'm going to count I'm going to count you in. 1 2 3 4 C. 2 3 go to D. 1 2 3 go to E. 2 3 and stop. All right. I like that you you fixed your hands. You remember that, right? So we play into our pants. So we're not playing like this. But we're playing into our pants, stretching and then using our wrists. After E is F. Now, on our steel pans, we have an F up here, but that, that is actually an F sharp. There's a symbol next to it. The F I would like you to go to is down here. Okay, it's next to the C on the left-hand side. All right, so my friends, F is right over here. F, there's F. Can you show me F, please? Good stuff. Once you found F, we're going to jump over to G. Can you find G? Skip over to G. G. There's G. Look for the letter G. Right here. G. All right, so we have five notes. Let's try it. Okay, we're going to be doing a song, a song in, a, in a little bit. Here we go. One, we're going to start on C. One, two, three, four, C. Two, three, four, D. Two, three, four, E. Two, three, four, F. Two, three, four, G. Two, three, four. So when you're rolling on F, you're looking for the next note, which is G. So it follows the same pattern of skipping, okay? We skip over a note. We started on C, we skipped over a note to D. Play D, skipped over a note to E. Went down to F, skipped over a note to G. Okay? So I know your pen is in labeled. Just remember that after your E, you're coming down to the note that's beside the first note you started with. That doesn't sound complicated at all. <laughs> okay. And then the pattern continues. From here, jump over a note. From here, jump over a note. From here, jump over a note. Okay? Okay, so we have C, we have D, we have E, we have F, we have G. After G is A. A is at 3 o'clock. Think of your clock. A is at 3 o'clock. Perfect. A. After A, there we go. Find A. Find A. There's A. There you got it. Good stuff. Good stretching. After A, we have B. Where's B? Skip over a note, and there you go. You fix your hands. Good stuff. B, and then our last note, our last note is a C, but guess what? It's not the same C we started with. It's the C that is in front of the note that we started with. So this is the first note, and this is our last note, okay? This is our last note. All right, so I think we can do this. Let's try doing this all together. Here we go. Are we ready? All right, here we go. We're going to try it once without music, and then we're going to try it with music, okay? All right. One, two, three, four. C. Two, three. D. E. Look for F. Look for G. Look for A is at 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock. And B is at 2 o'clock. And C, we're going to do it again. Don't even worry about it. Let's try it again. So show me where C is. Just point to C. C. Now point to D. Now point to E. Now point to F. F is down here. So this is always our fourth note, F. And then the pattern continues. Skip over a note, G. Skip over a note, A. Skip over a note, B. And our last note is C. First note, last note, C, D, E, down to F. Skip, G, skip, A, skip over a note, down to C. Let's try that one more time. All right, here we go. Here we go. I'm going to put on some music, so I'm going to put on a beat. I'm going to put on a beat. Now, this beat is a little fast, okay? So instead of, it, instead of us rolling for four beats, we're going to roll for eight, okay? All right? So it's going to sound like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's how long we're rolling, okay? Before we move to D. We got that? All right. Here we go. 
Here we go. I'm going to count you in. One, two. Wait, don't start. One, two. One, two, three. Let's go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. D. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. E. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. F. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. G. Two, three. Look for your A while you're rolling. A. Three, four, five, six, seven. B. Two, three, four. Look for your last note is C. Six, seven, A, and one. Good stuff. Now I want to tell you something. I like what I was. I was seeing your your sneakers. What is your name? Yes. Say it again. Anthony. I love what Anthony was doing. This is what Anthony was doing with his foot. Right. He was keeping the beat. So this is telling us how long we need to roll for. Our feet are counting for us. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Switch. One, two, three, four. Right? It's feeling the beat. Let's do it one more time. Here we go. One, two, three, four. Let's go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, D. Five, six, seven, E. Three, four, five, six, down to F. Over to G. Nice and gentle, gentle. A. A is at three o'clock. And B, that's right. Down to C is your last note. Uh, you guys are superstars. You guys are superstars. All right, we're going to try something real quick. First note. I'm excited. First note is A. We're rolling on A for two beats. A. Find A, find A. Find A. Who's tapping? I can hear it. All right, after A, we're gonna go to B flat, something new. B flat, B flat, right? Good stuff. So this is A, B flat, A, B flat, good stuff. All right, and stop one second, stop one sec, stop one second. There's A, B flat, okay? Our third note, eyes on me, our third note is C, okay? But the C that we're going to hit, it might vary because we have different pans. Um, you're using the inside C. That's the C you're using. That's the C you're using. This is the C you're using. A, B, C, A, B flat, C. A, B flat, C. A, B flat, C, good stuff. A, B flat, C. Can you show me that? A, show me A. A, B flat, C. All right, so right there. All right, right there. Here we go. I wonder if this will work. Da, it's gonna, it's gonna go four times. It's gonna sound like this. One, two, switch, one, two, switch, one, two, and off. One, two, one, two, one, two, do it again. One, two, one, two, one, two, and stop one more time. One, two, one, two, one, two, and stop. Perfect. That's the introduction. Easy, right? Here's the chorus. 
B flat with your left hand. Ba. Right? And hold it a little. There you go. And your right hand, so just once, your right hand is going to hit D. Ba da. But the D that you're hitting is a high D. So not on the outside, on the inside. Ba da. Ba da. Ba da. This one. Ba da. Not to. There you go. You're, what you're doing is a chord. Pretty cool. But we're going to go. Ba da. Perfect. But nice and gentle. Ba da. Use this hand first. Ba da. Right, just once. So this is what it's going to sound like. So this is what it's going to sound like. Can I borrow your sticks for a second? It's going to sound like this. Ba -da -bum -bum -bum. C, C, C. Ba -da One, two, three. Okay. All right. So, here's what's going to happen. I, I'm going to ask you all, can you, can everybody just move down one? I'm going to jump in the middle and I'm going to play it for you, okay? So now, you have the notes. I should have just told you to move over the first time. Sorry about that. I'm going to jump in the middle and I'm going to play what you're going to be playing, okay? And then we're going to start over, over and you're going to join me, okay? Here we go. So do we understand what's happening? So we've added the front. It's okay. We're going to do it again. So we've added the first four, right? The first four lines. Da, da, da. Right? We do that four times. And then we're going to go straight to the chorus. Feeling hot, hot, hot. Right? B flat, D, C, C, C. Okay? So I'm going to play it for you. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to come on this side. So I'm going to ask you to move down one so I can play next to you so you can hear what it sounds like, okay? Can I ask you to move over one? All right. We're going to try it again. Oh, and do me a favor. My friends, my friends over here, my little friends, um, when we're playing, play a little softer, okay? Just a little bit softer, okay? All right. Let's try it.
So do we understand a little bit more of what's happening? So I know I keep asking you guys to move. Can you come down one? So I'm going to join my friends over here. You stay right where you are. All right, so just to, to let you know, the part that goes feeling hot, hot, hot. So it's B flat. Show me where B flat is. But I need you to hit it with your left hand. Good stuff, right? But just once. Ba-dum. This one. One, two, three. So it's... So it sounds like this, feeling hot, 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 perfect, hot, hot, all right, right there. So we're going to do the same thing before we go, we're going to do it one more time, we're going to do it one more time, and I'm going to play with you guys. Um, let me put this down. superstars and you know why I'm saying that because the other group didn't do a song the other group just did the scales so you guys did you guys did a scale plus you did a song so that's great take your hand and give yourself a pat on the back you guys are awesome how was that was that hard was it hard kind of sort of not really no hey thank you I have a quick question for you. Can you tell me one thing that you learned about this instrument today? Anything? Yes. You learned that it was an instrument, okay. So that's wonderful. A lot of people don't know about the steel pan because when I play, people are like, what is this thing? And they look underneath and they're just like, how does it work? So steel pan, you learned, that, uh, you learned about the steel pan today. Anything else? Yes. Say it louder. It's kind of like a piano, right? We have notes just like a piano, just like any other instrument. We have notes that make sounds and we can play songs. And here's my question. 
Good stuff, Anthony. I have a question for you. What type of music does this instrument play? Hmm. What type of music does this instrument play? Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. My dad always says, go for it, Sue. Go for it. It's okay if you trip and fall. Go for it. What kind of instrument, what kind of music does this instrument play? What kind of instrument does this instrument play? It plays any kind of instrument, any kind of music, right? So it's not just Caribbean music. It's not just calypso music. It's not just reggae music or soca music. It plays any type of music, any genre, right? So where is this instrument found? Not where was it invented. Where do we find it? We didn't talk about that, did we? Where do we find this instrument? Where do we find it? Where can I find it? If I took a plane, where could I take a plane to to find this instrument? Yep. We can, okay, so I'll tell you some places. Did you want to answer? Florida, there is a gentleman playing it in Florida, so we can find it in America, North America. So Canada. This instrument is big in France. So Jeff and I were talking a little earlier about a gentleman who made two of these instruments. His name is Tommy Critchlow. And he, it was, it was France or was it Sweden, you said? Sweden, my mistake. He took the steel pan to Sweden. They had an annual music festival, and he brought pan to Sweden. But it also is huge in France. It's huge in Switzerland. It's massive in Japan. Japan has their own steel pan festival. In addition to Trinidad's massive steel pan festival called Panorama, um, I connected with someone in Brazil who plays this. Last week on Instagram, I connected with a guy in Guadeloupe. Every single morning, he plays for the cruise ships that come in, and he just does a live. And it's just like, wow, OK. Um, it's in Australia. It is in Finland. It's in Holland. It is in Alaska. It is in Nigeria. Nigeria has a steel pan and marimba festival. So basically, it's making its way around the world. You know what I mean? So it's not restricted to just the Caribbean. It's a musical instrument just like a piano, just like a violin, right? So it's versatile. These are the lead pans, but we have other steel, steel pans within the orchestra, OK? So I would just say, take a moment and go over to the table, open it up. And you can see some of these pictures, right? Some of these bands. Um, Jeff and myself, we played in something called Pan Around the Neck. That's taking these instruments and putting a strap on. And we're walking and we're playing Pan Around the Neck. Because guess what? They're, they never used to have stands, right? So people used to take um, metal objects and walk with them and chip, right? And knock them and make rhythms. And once they had these, it's like, these are kind of big and heavy. How do we, you know what I mean? How do we maneuver it? We want to play at the same time. Somebody had the, the idea to fashion a strap, attach it to the pan. And it became a pan around the neck band. OK? Pan around the neck. And yeah, feel free to go and take a look. And you can see some of the other instruments in the band. These are the lead pans. We have double seconds. As we get lower in the sound, the skirts get longer, and we have more drums. Uh, Jeff was telling us, showing us the sticks for a bass. Jeff, do you have the sticks for a bass? The sticks for the basses are much longer. Can you come a little closer and just show our friends over here? They're much longer. And we have a lot more rubber. The reason why we have a lot more rubber is because we have to accommodate the, we have to, it, the, the big pieces of rubber are playing the larger notes on the lower sounding pans. So a bass, this is how he would play a bass pan. He would have six drums around him, like in a semicircle. And in each drum, he has three notes, only three. See in here, we have 12 on the outside, 12 on the inside, and then we have five on the inside. We have 29. Now imagine, instead of all of these notes, you just have it, you just have three notes. This is one note, this is the second note, and this is the third note. So it's a larger note. You need a larger 
you need more rubber to accommodate that surface area. Yeah. So you're not using your fine motor skills, you're using your gross motor skills to hit those, those, those pans, those notes. And you have a 12 bass. Now imagine someone has six over here and six suspended in the air, right? And you're playing them like this. You know, you're just going around your instrument. So yeah, I think that this instrument is pretty fascinating. So prior to this, I played the cello and I played the piano. And um, when I visited my first panyard in Toronto, I never looked back. <laughs> so this is what I've been doing for the past 20 something years. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions before we go? Anybody? No? I just want to thank you for joining me today. That was fantastic. Yeah, this is... No, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I will be playing...